Thank you very much for joining us at the Chicago Cultural Center for the 11th Annual Chicago, uh, Creative Chicago Expo. Uh, and this keynote presentation by contemporary fashion designer and artist, uh, Chicago's own Maria Pinto. Um, my name is Tanya Gross with the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events, and I'm the new fashion director for the city of Chicago. As a fellow designer working to build my own brand in Chicago, I have admired much of Maria's 20-year career through impressive and enviable headlines. Um, as Maria opened her boutique and launched her luxury brand, Maria Pinto, as she's designed for the Joffrey Ballet, for the James Hotel, and as the creative director at Mark Shale. She's also created a work that is now in the permanent collection for the Field Museum. And then there's Michelle Obama, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey, Brooke Shields, Marsha Gay Harden, and all of these women dressed by Maria Pinto. So, but I think it's her tenacity, it's her fearlessness, and her ability to adapt in a dynamic and industry that I admire most about her. These are challenges that I think all of us in the creative, creative industries can relate to, um, fashion or otherwise. So Maria is a shining example of an American designer that incorporates innovative design with luxurious fabrics, transforming these elements into versatile, well-crafted, modern silhouettes at accessible price, price points. Maria's impeccable work elevates our fashion brand and the business of fashion in Chicago, and that's why I've asked her to be here today. We're thankful that she continues to innovate and that she makes Chicago her home. So Maria's latest headline, raising more than $270,000 in a Kickstarter to launch her new line, M2057. There's much more to come from Maria Pinto and so much to learn from her today. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce Maria Pinto. Hi. Hi. Thank you, thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you, Barbara, if you're out here somewhere, and um, all of you for being here. Um, so what I'd like to do is share a little bit about my background for you to get a better sense of what I've actually done, because everything she's told you isn't true. Um, and, uh, and a little bit about um, my process and the, uh, my creative process. And then I'd like to have a conversation and just like talk with you and see what I can share with you that might help in your process. Um, so. I guess you could summarize my, my career to date as um, I thought of it this morning. It goes from tie-dye to Barney's and Bergdorf. So you say, well, how does that happen? So when I was 12 or 13, I, um, I discovered Janis Joplin. And, and, and of course, what goes with that is tie-dye. So um, I, what's in your household that's white besides sheets? Men's underwear. My brothers and father had no whites left. <laughs> I thought they were beautiful. I don't know how they felt about it. But so from there, I knew, I knew for me, everything was about the blending of fashion and art. And I decided to study the School of the Art Institute because I was able to do that. And um, I, I had some really amazing experiences there. Um, I feel like everything is a building block to the next thing. And one thing that happened there was, um, we had a, a presentation for a, um, a critique, and uh, it was um, the judges were Genevieve Buck from the Tribune and Emmanuel Angaro. And Genevieve Buck asked me if I had ever heard of, if I was inspired by Jeffrey Bean. And I said, no, in fact, I thought he was kind of a designer for old ladies' clothes. <laughs> Very old, you know, mature. So I uh, took myself to the 28 shop at Marshall Fields and discovered this amazing artist um, Jeffrey Bean, if you don't know about him, I highly recommend anyone studying fashion should know about him um, because he studied medicine before he went into fashion. And so his seams and work, I mean, he kind of was a huge turning point in what we see and take for granted today from Balmain and Balenciaga to Rick Owens in terms of he studied the body and his seeming follows the musculature of the body. And it's what we see today, but he's really the source of it. So if you go back and look at his work, it's really quite spectacular. The funny part of that story is that, so I finished at the Art Institute. I went to New York wanting to work for him, and I decided I, I can be a little determined and a little hard-headed. <laughs> and I decided I didn't want to work for anyone else, even if I had to intern for him and waitress at night, which is what I did. 
um, because I felt like he was like this amazing master, and I was determined to be in his, in his presence in whatever capacity I could be. Um, uh, interesting piece of that is what I came to realize after I was there a few months was there were, had never been any women in the design team. And unfortunately, Mr. Bean was, uh, that wasn't going to ever change, so I had the good fortune of staying on for two seasons as an intern. And I guess what I want to share with you is like, I feel like when you finish school, you're just barely beginning your education. And so for me, that was just like the perfect extension of my education. So I fast forward, I come back to Chicago, and um, I started um, a small collection under the name Maria Pinto. And it was actually with, um, whoops, got a point in the right direction, right? Um, so it's, I started with accessories. And what I didn't realize at the, that moment in time, according to Malcolm Gladwell, the idea of a tipping point was that I knew I wanted to do accessories for a lot of reasons. I had an instinct about them being relevant in the moment. It was just as Pashminas had t taken off. Um, and I was so, it was, you know, it was timing and luck and all those things that come together. Um, if you recall a store named Ultimo in Chicago, Joan Weinstein was the first buyer to see my collection and to purchase it, which gave me the good fortune of then having doors open in New York. And, you know, when I look back, I didn't realize like how, this was really crazy. I mean, I was had appointments with Bernie, Barney's, Bergdorf's, and Sachs. I'm like, that's unheard of. And so, I, I mean, I'm always so grateful for these things. And, and I, it's not that I didn't appreciate it, but it was moving so quickly that I just sort of like now reflect on it and go, whoa, that's not the norm. Um, and so at that time, these accessories were really relevant more than they are at the moment because I think the pashmina craze really brought an interest to accessories to the American market. And um, so we did these really lavish kinds of pieces, like, um, like the first one is actually um, a really amazing piece. It's actually um, sequin material that's over dyed and then cut and sewn onto chiffon. So it gives you an idea of kind of the, uh, the, the detail and embellishment and um, extravagance of the moment, I guess you could say. This is 1991. Um, this is a tulle wrap that's pleated, and um, here's a little cape, all tulle, and um, again, hand sewn. Um, this is a sequin material that we printed, folded, and sewn on. Like, okay, how many more things can you do to a poor piece of sequin? Um, so, so the accessories kind of got me on the map. But what I realized was, that wasn't supposed to happen yet, but what I realized was I felt I was missing something in, from the sculptural point of view. Like with clothing, there's such a three-dimensional part of it that accessories didn't offer me. So as an artist, I felt kind of frustrated. I didn't feel like I was as fulfilled, and so I started pushing into ready-to-wear. Fast forward, I was very fortunate again that I was picked up at Bergdorf, and through the course of my career, I've had the good fortune of dressing some amazing, inspiring women and um, being on the cover of Bergdorf catalog. And, um, you know, it's kind of those things when you look at this, you just kind of go, you're so grateful and so appreciative of what happened through this process. And later we could share, like, what all those, I'd rather answer questions as to what around this you're curious about. So I'll just go through some other pieces of the puzzle right now. So what I'd like to talk to you about now is how I use inspiration and what my creative process is. Um, so for spring of 2008, one of my favorite collections is, uh, was inspired by Richard Serra, the sculptor. And you kind of go, well, how does that really relate to fashion? And so for me, the way I take the, uh, the idea away is the idea of um, suspension and um, balance and space. And so how I interpreted that was this elliptical shape that spirals her body. Um, it also goes into, um, this was this collar that was inspired by that, that image of the sculpture is squares. There's like 75 squares of hand cut organza. Um, but it always kind of goes back to like how does something suspend on the body, this insert of lace and last. Like this is a fairly heavy, heavy dress, it's sequins, and it's suspended on two pieces of bias, charmeuse. So it's kind of an intriguing part of the process as to how to make these actually function and not have, what do they call it, Mal red, red carpet malfunctions. Um, so it, it, to me, that's a, a, what I love about the 
the art of designing clothing is all those parts. It's not just like the beautiful fabrics, but then, as you all know, anyone that's made a dress, the engineering of it. Um, so spring 2009, I was obsessed with a film by Sofia Coppola, um, Marie Antoinette. And what I loved about it was the spirit of this kind of free spirit, um, wild, beautiful colors, um, there's sort of a decadence that I just found really intriguing in terms of embellishment, which we brought into this and trying to make, but, but also when you look at my collections, I hope that it, they don't really look like the inspiration because the last thing I want you to think is, oh, she went to Santa Fe and there we have like turquoise dresses, you know? So I always use an inspiration in a very, um, I try to think as a subliminal way. Um, here's that sort of Rococo bustle, but this is a cotton white little spring coat. So I love the, the kind of contrast of like this very common fabric, but in kind of a, uh, you know, a very couture-like silhouette. And this is, goes back to like all the bonbons and the confections and the colors, layers and layers of chiffon. Um, and if you take note of the hair as well. I have a very good friend here in Chicago named Charles Lord, um, who we, I would do the collection and then it was at a point where you kind of stop and you need other people to kind of resuscitate. You're, you know, you're, you're at this point where you go, is this all crazy or is it good? And so he would come in and then he'd get all inspired and he would do these wild hairdos and inspire the whole styling and photo shoots. Um, and this piece was really special in terms of um, layers and layers of tool. I mean, I guess at that point I never thought about I didn't look at like how much is it gonna cost, I just looked at how can I make it the most beautiful it possibly can be. And it was at the moment that that was pretty, you know, acceptable. There was enough people that wanted these really extravagant, beautiful pieces, and so I didn't let that stop me. Um, and we'll talk about that as, you, as I share M2057 with you. Um, so for fall 2009, I had seen an exhibit in New York called Rococo, the Continuous Curve, and it was beautiful. And it showed how Rococo, this kind of decadent, um, it's very, um, often it's more asymmetric than this, but it's very flamboyant. And how it went through history and inspired artists such as Art Nouveau, and more importantly, what resonated with me was Rana Rod's chair. And so we took this idea of a continuous line, a continuous curve, and I mean, this is one, one flowing beautiful piece of wood, right? And so it, we used that idea in our patterns, in our embellishment. So this collar became like this really technical, interesting piece that's one pattern, no seams. Um, here is the, in the embellishment, it's um, embroidered mohair and um, beads. The back of the dress flows through the bodice, so it's like this beautiful um, kind of Watteau back. Um, same here with like this kind of open, we showed it, we shot it nude, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dare you. Um, but it's like this whole idea again of like creating continuous lines through the body. Um, last collection I'll show you was inspired by tango. And what I found intriguing about tango was the sort of idea of tension and, and how um, the whole the movement. And, and so we use that as a guide to develop everything based on bias cutting. So it starts with this little top, which is cut on the bias, and the skirt is little organza uh, petals that are hand cut, cut on the bias, and then extrava extravagantly inserted with little crystals. Um, here you see the bias pieces that are creating the flower running down her skirt. And then this is um, hundreds of little petals made out of bias cut, folded, hand tacked organza. And the last piece, so what, what I also want to share with you is what I find interesting about um, inspiration is how it flows from where you, every season, and then it becomes part of your vocabulary. That's why I think it's really important to sort of always fuel my brain with like new ideas. Because as you see, there's a thread where Richard Serra started, it continues. The Rococo continuous curve. The skirt is a continuous curve. It looks like kind of a crazy wild mess on the surface. It's 30 yards of chiffon. It's cut on the bias. It's um, strips that are then sewn, and if you look at the inside of the dress, which I have to photograph so I could show it to you someday, the inside of the dress are these spirals that I'd start out very, it's very deliberate, even though it looks very undeliberate. It's these spirals that start small at the hip and then they open up through the hem, and that creates this wild extravagance, right? <laughs> um, 
So the next piece I want to share with you is just I've had the good fortune of um, sharing the creative process with other um, uh, artists, so to speak. And what I, I really enjoy that, and I'm taking it out of the fashion piece and making it be about something else, even though it might still have something to do with the body. So um, DIFA is Design Industry Fighting for AIDS. Um, Donnie Medea from Blackbird invited me to work with this pastry chef to do a presentation in New York for a fundraiser. And the only criteria was chocolate. And she said, you know, what can we do if I heat the chocolate and we could spray it on the dress? I'm like, sure, why not? So I made the skirt out of, uh, it's a Gipur lace made out of, um, of uh, string. And, um, and then the top is leather. And we just put it on a mannequin and we had it set up so that it could s spiral, turn, and he, she just shot it, shot away with the chocolate. It was really cool. And what I liked about the piece is like, you know, when you get in a room, I love the challenge of like, when you want, I mean, we all watch Project Runway once in a while, right? So I love when you see what everyone does with an idea or a project. And what was interesting to me and um, Tara from Blackbird was well, we came up with this thing that was just so outlier, so minimal and modern. And so that just always reminds me of like, sort of like the cleanness of what something can be as opposed to something so, so much more. I've had the good fortune of working for the Joffrey Ballet. Um, in particular, this ballet was um, with Edward Leong, this amazing choreographer. And what I love about, again, like working with other people, it's like you kind of learn about their process. So he was in New York, I flew to New York, and he invites me to his place, and he's got, you know, a couple glasses of wine out, and he's got Philip Glass playing, and he's sitting there, he goes, just listen. And then we have this conversation, and he starts telling me the inspiration for this was um, Renaissance court dance. And if you think about what that means, it's that these, you know, this is where people went to flirt and mingle, 15 and, and people were getting married at 15 and 16. So that was the premise of the ballet, like this flirtation between the dancers. There are actually 24 dancers on the stage at any given time. And so my interpretation on it was to take some of the elements of that period, such as like ribbons and chiffon, and, but also to kind of make it a little provocative in terms of like the sheer fabric on the back of the man's top and you know, kind of playing a little bit with making it a little more contemporary. Um, and then um, this is a really fun project. And if you don't know it, you should check it out. The company is called The Seldoms. It's Carrie Hansen. She's here in Chicago. And she does beautiful works. And she asked me if I would do costumes for her production called This Is Not a Dance Concert. And because it's site specific, it really creates some interesting um, opportunities and challenges. And so it was at the Harris Theater. And the dancers and the audience moved together through the theater. And so I said to her, well, what's the mood of the clothing? And she, I said, what, what period is this? Is it today, tomorrow? She says, hyper, hyper um, present. So I don't know where I went with it, but I decided that I didn't want to start with uh, raw materials. I went to flea markets and thrift shops and Salvation Armies. I know where they all are. I know the good ones, if anyone wants to share. Um, and these are, nothing is what it start, how it started. So like the marabou skirt was actually a vest. The, the leather piece she has on was actually a man's jacket. And we kind of cut it apart. And everything became something else, which I really find fun. I mean, we, for $300, we came back with bags of stuff that we just, I just took a scissor to and started having, uh, you know, just, it was an interesting way to sort of do something that I normally would do so differently. Um, and uh, like the t-shirt is just cut away. So I guess my point is, it's kind of like, um, you could kind of make something out of anything. The, the sequin on his legs, I don't know if you could really see, there's like these patches, was a sequin dress that we, I ironed the sequins so they kind of melted and got a little bit destroyed. And then we made him leather gauntlets. The whole thing was kind of like just mad hat. And um, like her, her patterned stock, uh, leggings was actually a crazy ugly dress except for the fabric was beautiful. Um, and then it takes me to the Field Museum. Um, so the Field Museum, um, was a really wonderful experience. Um, Alika Wally invited me to curate an exhibit. And her idea was, how can we get a different perspective uh, within the field's collections? And um, within the museum, beyond what you see on, in, in the galleries, there's millions of objects below, under the earth. 
And I had the good fortune of walking through this and coming up with this concept. And um, the concept was, for me, it's always going to come back to what goes on the body. And it also played into what's, what does clothing mean, and especially how does it impact women. And so one of the themes, there were like three themes within the exhibit. One of them was armor. And so you, um, this beautiful piece of um, uh, African uh, crocodile vest, we juxtaposed with pieces from my collection, this being what I consider the modern power suit. So isn't the power suit, isn't what we wear every day a form of armor? Like we all got dressed up this morning deciding, okay, here's where I'm gonna go and what do I wanna wear? How is it gonna make me feel? So I always think that there's an impact beyond designing beautiful things as to how can I design things that empower women. Um, the other, another theme was aesthetic and, and what could potentially have been an inspiration. So this was from my 2010 collection, the black dress, and the piece on the left was the first piece I actually chose for the exhibit, and it's um, a raincoat made out of seal intestine. And I thought, wow, if I had seen that, would that have potentially inspired this? I mean, it didn't, it had nothing to do with each other, but it just intrigued me that they could be juxtaposed together. And then the last piece I want to share with you was um, this idea of um, seduction and um, revealing. So on the left is this beautiful, it's called a Mongolian, uh, it's called a deal, it's from Mongolia. And obviously she's covered from head to toe, no, not to toe, head to mid-calf and beyond her fingertips. Would she be walking through the room and be any less provocative or seductive than her? So it's kind of just, I don't know, it's a weird way my head works, so now you're learning more than you want to know. Um, <laughs> and then, so this is the piece that was, um, so the field commissioned me to create a uh, piece that is in the collection, and this, to me, represents all the pieces that were in the exhibit. So there were, um, I, I had to edit, there were so many things I wanted to show you. Um, there were these fur short shorts from Greenland, and I, that kind of gave a nod to these, these, this, these are shearling pants. And then there was this beautiful headpiece from China that was all these red um, fur pompons, and that kind of gave a, gave a nod to this collar. But it was kind of strange, and what I recognized when I, I went to, I was on another trip for New York, and I went sourcing materials for this, and it was weird, like when I came back and laid out what I looked for, it wasn't deliberate, and what I, what I recognized is when I just sort of stay really connected to myself, it's really organic in terms of then I came back and I'm like, wow, all these pieces are everything I've been seeing. It was sort of like this very subconscious um, effort. Um, so this brings us to today, which is M2057. As um, Tanya mentioned, um, so the whole idea with M2057 is, well, it's two pieces. I mean, I stopped designing in 2010 and I worked as creative director at Mark Shale and I did some, a lot of these creative projects, but what I realized was I really missed designing. What I also realized was, okay, that's not an excuse to go back and do what I did before, because that's kind of boring, right? So what I recognized was, how can I take everything that uh, Maria Pinto was about, in terms of quality, fit, um, design integrity, I'm a little maniacal about all these elements, but how do I bring it to a place that's more accessible? And also this whole idea of what I'm so green, and I mean Kat sitting here, who's worked on our website, and I'm horrible with technology. So what I realized was there's just a great opportunity. How, do, how and where does fashion meet technology? And so one of the places was, how do we launch the new company? So we went to Kickstarter. And um, interesting experience. I'm gonna leave more of this to questions because we can talk about that for the whole day if you wanted to. Um, so we launched on Kickstarter. Yes, it was successful. We did a 45-day window. It was insane. I was so glad when it was over, and I was so relieved that we achieved our goal. Um, and so, so behind that, though, was, okay, so how do we make this accessible? How do we make it, um, how do we make it relevant? And so that became a combination of several elements. Um, we started with this amazing fabric that I have had a header for for probably a year and a half, just sitting there waiting for something to happen with it. It's a washable jersey from Italy. And so there's two weights of fabric in the collection. It was the most interesting experience because I always think of the word distill when I think about this collection because it takes everything. I mean, I was doing 100-piece collections and we launched with seven dresses, three jackets, and three scarves that I, I find really, um, um, I guess it's more inspiring to me 
to think that you could do so much with so little and still tell the story, still achieve what you're trying to do. Whereas in the past, it's like you kind of, I know I, I can recognize that many of you in the room are probably are the same way. It seems like more is better, and that editing process is so difficult. And so this, everything about M2057 is edit, minimal, keep it real. And um, what I love about the collection is that they're dresses that really, they're, they're like blank canvases in reference to my whole the way I look at everything from an art point of view. So they're, they're a blank canvas that any one of us could take any of these pieces and make our own. Um, a little backstory. So you might notice the necklace I have on. So I have a good friend who's actually here tonight. Um, when I was in college, I um, did a whole collection based on bones. And um, he, if you don't know him, everyone should Google him. Tom Skumsky, he's an amazing sculptor who works out in Ottawa. And we were out to see him in, at his farm. And so in his studios, which are amazing, and I'm like a kid in a candy shop, just not, I don't know what to look at first. There was this pile of bones. <laughs> so I laid them out, I was taking pictures, and he said, do you want to take some? I'm like, yeah, I mean, you know, you may as well give me a Harry Winston. I was like so happy with my bones. Fast forward, a friend of mine had a, a birthday party, and they had a pig roast. So I left with more bones, and I made the jewelry that we showed in the collection. Um, with M2057. And last, a uh, couple more shots. So here's the skull. And, um, but you can see the range in the collection. So it's like, it's very aspirational in terms of, compared to um, Maria Pinto at $1,200 dresses, these range from 275 to 375 Right now, we'll be adding some other fabrics that might bump it just a little. But my point is, I wanted this to be more about more, more women, like I had so many really great clients that will wear this, but I had a lot of clients that couldn't wear what I was designing before because it was just, you know, very, very expensive. And so this is more exciting and more interesting to me. And that's that. So now you guys get to ask questions if you want. Thank you. to the microphone. Okay. So if any of you have questions, you're welcome to come up to the microphone and ask them. I also have some, we used uh, the text as in platform to facilitate the questions, so I have a few of those as well that we can go to. Okay, go ahead. What was the hardest part about the Kickstarter campaign? Um, well, the hardest part was the timing of everything. And um, we decided to launch we decided to launch Labor Day weekend because we wanted to time it with Fat New York Fashion Week. So we had less than six weeks to, to do everything in terms of making a film, um, photographs, getting all the content up, creating a website. Um, so there, it was always a time issue. And then the next part that was probably the most difficult was I knew going into it we'd have challenges because it's a tech male-centric concept, crowdfunding. A lot of women had heard of it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know, wow, oh, what do I have to do? How do I have to do it? So we're into it a week, and we realized like, our numbers weren't going up. And for, for any of you who don't know about Kickstarter, you determine the number that you want to raise, and if you don't achieve it, you get nothing. I never gambled. I mean, what was I thinking? So that was the, difficult, that was the beginning of the challenge. And what we recognized was, so we hosted a, a press event and as soon as we were in front of people and they got to see and touch it, our numbers went up. So we went on this junket and started doing events all over the place. So the hardest part was getting her to understand it and how simple it was. And at the end of the day, I mean, then when they got their head wrapped around, oh, if I write a check, I get a dress. It's not if you write a check, you get nothing. So it was the education process. That was probably the hardest part. Well, and the rewards component to after how are you getting through all of that? It's fulfilling we're, all we're, of We're the producing and we're shipping in about a week and a half. It's, yeah. That's, the, that's also a mind-blowing part to yeah. the Kickstarter process. That's the, the fun problem. part. Yeah. That's the fun part. Yeah. It's beautiful to see everything made. I mean, any of you that design, what, what's more satisfying than when you have one design and you see 300 of them? Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Don't so. be shy. Angel, you must have a question for Maria Angel's Pinto. Here. Come on. Where are you? Hi. It's all your fault that I'm here. <laughs> you know I don't love stages. <laughs> man, what I do for a good-looking man. <laughs> 
Okay, so why don't I go to Texas in? So, Ms. Pinto, will we see a bricks and mortar store here in Chicago for your new line? Or not even no. just your new line? <laughs> no. It's not going to happen? <laughs> no. Do you want to talk a little bit about that or is it? Uh... Yeah. Um, I think the, I mean, I think there's a point of like embracing where where we are in our culture in terms of consuming and shopping. And so to me, it seems like to do brick and mortar is like backstepping. I did it, I loved it, I had an amazingly beautiful store. Done, next. Now I think it's more interesting to embrace technology, to continue to sell to my retailers that I sold to before. Um, we'll probably have a fit shop in our workrooms so that for those who still want to touch and feel, they have the opportunity to come and try things on. But no brick and mortar, kind of been there, did that. But then again, I never say never. Don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> this isn't being filmed. It's oh, no one will God. Know. In two years when I open the store, I'm like, you said you were never going to do it. <laughs> like, that would be a bad thing if, I know. Was, if you were wrong on that. Uh, why is it Chicago is not more widely recognized as a fashion hub? I know you think that I all planted this in here, but I did not. Why is Chicago not more widely recognized as a fashion hub? What do you think Chicago needs or is missing to make it that? That's like the most loaded question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. Um, I mean, it kind of goes, there's so, many, there's so many legs to that idea. I mean, first of all, I mean, the fashion industry in other cities that were fashion centers are shrinking. I mean, cities like New York, I mean, they're dispersing into other places for production. It's still a hub where, I mean, at the end of the day, what is fashion about? It's about creating something and selling it. And so what does New York afford? All of those things. Resources to design, materials, factories, um, marketing, press. The, you know, I mean, where are all the editors? And then you go to... Um, you know, buyers, I mean, they're not gonna come to Chicago. They're busy enough. They're already cutting their tri trips down to New York and if they go to Europe. So I think the challenge is not to say you can't design here. I'm trying to prove that, continuously prove that through my career. People ask me constantly, why do I stay in Chicago? I mean, everyone in New York has always asked me, why do I stay in Chicago? And there I am, that determined little pain in the neck, staying in Chicago because I believe in it. And now especially it's like, I feel like at this stage of my career, why do I have to do that? We're a global economy. I mean, there's challenges to being in Chicago, and we've talked about that. Um, you know, my, my, we're producing some in Chicago, some in New York. Um, I still have to go to New York for market, but I could still work here. You just have to figure out how to layer in the logistics. Well, and I think I would still question, what is a fashion hub? You know, what does that mean? Right. To Chico I think Chicago is trying to figure out what that means. I don't think we should try to be what other fashion hubs are. Yeah. I think we definitely we have to figure out what it is that can sustain itself in Chicago. And most important is that if you, we can keep great designers working here, I mean, there's some things that would be helpful, like anyone want to open a factory? Yeah, we could use more factories here because it's very difficult to outsource and then have to get on a plane. It's very costly for small starting companies. Mm -hmm. But I think it's more important to let it, okay, figure it out and you know, try to you know, be supported by the community, which is great if everyone here could like, support designers that they know. I think that helps in whatever way we can. Yeah, I have another question, but let's get to, I don't know who was yeah. here first, so we, well, to the lady, okay. Maria, you mentioned that you're not a techie. Um, you, some of your designs look extraordinarily complicated. I'm curious how you actually uh, resolve that complication w without, uh, is it a hands-on process that you do or is you do sketches or how do you do that? Um, it's a hands-on and it's also a collaborative process. So within my team, it's like I, I like to sketch and I particularly like to drape things because fabric kind of has its own life. So when I get in front of a mannequin, it's like that's where the sculptural possibilities begin. And then it's having a really great tech partner that can really take my ideas and help. And I'm very fortunate, I, I, uh, someone who's worked with me for about eight years, Daniel. And I'll show him a, a drawing or I'll drape something. And then he actually takes it into putting it into a pattern. So it's very technical, but it's not, it's not um, I don't do design. Like there's a lot of designers that actually do all their drawings. My interns, Autumn and, and Alina, they show me all these things that they do on the computer. I don't draw on the computer. I don't do really do much on the computer. So I, from that tech side, I'm sort of shut off. But from, the, from a technical like construction and sewing and you know, developing the pattern, that's sort of our forte. It's a little old school, I guess, right? <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. That answer. Yeah. So the, the demands of um, couture, that's one whole separate world. What was your biggest challenge when you went from that small, pricey client base into department store? Are you just in the middle of learning what that's like? Well, I, I wasn't, um, when I had my um, Maria Pinto label, we were selling to stores. We were selling to department stores and specialty boutiques. Um, I never did custom, and I, so that is couture. I don't do custom. I have a collection, and people can come in order. Like when you, if you came to my boutique, for example, someone might come in and say, my, you know, I have maybe this beautiful dress in blue, and someone might come in and say, my daughter's getting married. My daughter's getting married. She's interested in a wedding dress, and I would, I could recolor it white, but I would never change. I would never make a custom. So I've always worked in that sort of traditional umbrella in terms of designing samples, take them to market. Buyers take placing orders and then distributing. That help? Thank okay. you. Anyone else? So I have just one following question. I wanted to talk more about that collaborative process. If you could talk about that a little bit, and do you still seek that out, um, even with this new collection? More than ever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on a, on every level. I think something I always tell, like I was telling Tanya earlier, I was in Columbus, Ohio last uh, a couple weeks ago speaking to a, a design school, and there were about 200 fashion designers, and you know, we were talking about the process of getting into fashion. What does that look like? What do you need to do? And um, it's all about collaboration. Um, you know, I know my strengths, I, I, and I know my weaknesses. So you know, for me, it's like surround myself with people that are really smart in accounting, technology, business. Um, uh, so you bring in a lot of information that maybe isn't either your strong suit or your, that you have the time to really know as well as you know. I mean, I, what I do well is, I, I think, I design and I can market my work. Beyond that, I'm peripheral, I'm, I'm dangerous. I can get myself in so much trouble. <laughs> and so that's where I bring in the anchors, like here's the accountant and here's the business guy. And what's cool about it, like anyone starting out, I mean, you all have a network of friends and someone has a, knows an accountant. So, and, and you tell people what you're doing and they tell other people that might be interested in helping you. Because at the end of the day, you know what? Accountants are dying to work with people like us because their <laughs> process is so, I think, boring. It's interesting, I'm sure, when you're turned down by a spreadsheet, that's great. But they come around people like us and they're like, wow, how can I help you? What are you doing? And then they love helping build whatever it is that you're struggling with or you know, you're trying to move to the next level. So collaboration, maybe it's because I'm a twin. I have a twin, I've never done anything mm -hmm. alone. Yeah. And just one follow on to um, you know, the collaboration and, and how are you able, are you able to partner and collaborate with other Chicagoans and in sort of the manufacturing process? Because I guess, you know, we talked a lot today in all of these breakout sessions, all of these panel discussions we talk about making in Chicago. Do you think it's possible to have a thriving, successful national, international brand that can solely produce in Chicago? No. Because, I mean, depending on what you're designing, I mean, uh, a lot of the factories that I've worked with, if there's factories that I don't work with and anyone wants to work with me, give me your number. I don't find factories that can do the level of work for some of the kind of garments that I want to construct. Tailoring, leather, chiffon, bias. These are very difficult mediums to work in. And uh, there are factories here, they do a, a fine job with what they do, but you have to be realistic. Like, if you're gonna be in the playing field trying to hang next to designers that are produced in the best factories in the world, then you have to produce the best garments. And my challenge has always been that I don't find the factories of that caliber here, unfortunately. But maybe they're here. If you're here, I'm happy to work with you. I'd rather work here, it's easier. I don't have to like jump on a plane and go to New York. I, I work, all my photo shoots are done here. We use all Chicago talent, whether it be from stylists to photographers to uh, models. Um, I, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to try to support the community in any way I can because, this is, you know, let's keep it here, right? But sometimes there's challenges, like, you know, with selling. I can't have an agent sell my collection here. I have to sell in New York, so I have to hire an agent there. So, yeah. I think yeah. you have a question. Yeah. For the Kickstarter campaign, so A, you say you don't know a lot about technology. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering, how did you prepare for that campaign? And B, how did you come up with $250,000? For those of us who love your work, 
you know, I think some of us were going to the site every day to see where you were, to see if you're going to get to 250000 ah. How did you choose that rather than $75,000? Okay, I'll start with that part. So I was insane. Second piece was I realized when I like kind of laid out a, a plan, a forecast, what did I need to start the company? It wasn't going to be, 75000 was not going to take me where I needed to go. And I guess I could have started 75 and still raised the 250, but I think that if I started at 75, the fire would have been gone. You raise the 75, oh, we done, we're, we're, we can relax now. We never relaxed. It was full on. We hit the goal on Saturday afternoon, and then we actually we hit 250 on Saturday, and Monday we were at like 278 or something. Um, so it was just insanity. But in terms of technology, because as you put it, there's a lot of technology behind this, and here's where you'd have to talk to all your friends and their friends, because if it's an interesting project and somehow resonates with them, so my best friend, Emmanuel, who in Sepia, has a good client named Josh Golden. And um, he was in for drinks one night, and I had shared with Emmanuel that I was thinking about doing Kickstarter. And he was really nervous. He thought I was crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but I had been looking at it for about a year, and I thought, why not? I mean, you know what? I'm glad I did it. It was crazy. It was risky. But I ended up on the Charlie Rose show on Wednesday after I, and that's the challenge. If you don't take risks, nothing happens. Play it safe, you're not going to go anywhere. And I'm always taking risks. So Emmanuel says to Josh, Maria is going to do, wants to do this. She didn't know. Here's how funny Emmanuel is. And everyone knows he's my best friend. Um, this friend of mine is in fashion, and she's thinking about doing Kickstarter. And Josh is like, yeah, right. OK, Maria Pinto. And he goes, yeah, tell her to call me. <laughs> so he had no idea what he was getting into. I had no idea why I was meeting him. And the next thing, his team was on it. They're like, this is a really cool project. And they came on board knowing that, look it, we were all going to in it to win it. And no one got paid until I won the goal. And I had amazing support from all over the city. I had a photographer friend who flew in from LA to shoot the film and the, and the, the, the still, stills. I mean, I think if you're, I'd like to think that my craziness and my um, uh, obsession with perfection relates to other people that they say, OK, I want to get on board. She's crazy, but it, this is interesting. So if you're not crazy, nobody cares. They don't want to be part of your junk. So be crazy. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. still crazy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so. Sorry. I, I'm curious about the name that I'm 2057, where that came up with. Um, I have several questions, and okay. I'll just go ahead and you ask just stand the right question. There. Okay, I'll stay there. I'll, okay, I'll go one, one at a time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 2057. So, all right, Maria Pinto. We all know what Maria Pinto is. If I did it, Maria Pinto again, it's kind of like backstepping. People are going to be confused. I wanted a new name. I didn't want a word. I didn't want a flower. I didn't want to, you know, what's the word going to be? I'm like, no. If it's fashion meets technology, to me, numbers represent technology. So and then I had to come up with a number, and the number is when I turn 100. Now you all know how old I am. Great. <laughs> and, and that's another thing that's kind of, a, in a way, maybe it's my, I, my little I'm kind of a brat, because it's kind of like a throw in the face. Because in fashion, you know, what's fashion about? Youth. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of a throw in the face, because I'm saying to everyone, here's my age. I don't really care. You know? It's kind of being a brat. Right. Um, so this month in Vanity Fair, there was a big, you know, it was a big Hollywood issue. And of course, we've all watched the red carpets the last few weeks. And they had an article about the stylists and just this important, busy role that they have in molding our fashion and all of those things. How do you feel about that? And do you pursue stylists in the same way that some of these other big folks, big designers do? Um, I mean, I think it's a delicate balance because, look at anyone in the industry realizes the value of being on someone's back that's photographed and captioned wearing X. So do I, I, I never pursued it in the past. I, Kind of organically, it's happening right now because people are saying, oh, so-and-so should see this dress. She's coming into town to be uh, at an event, blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, sure, they could see it. Great. I, I, I find the whole thing very contrived. And I find the whole red carpet you know, show really kind of revolting. Because here's like this amazingly talented, beautiful actress. And what are we doing in our living rooms? Tearing her apart. It's kind of nasty, right? And I mean, I think some of them, you know, do I think they always look great? Do, do I think I could make them look better? Not as a designer, just let's say as a stylist. Could their hair be better? Could their makeup be better? Like, you've seen them looking better, but that night they decided to do something different, and maybe it wasn't their best, but like, so should we like trash them? 
And I get the idea of stylists because I also think that there's so much pressure on anyone in the spotlight planning for this kind of event that, yeah, they want to go to someone who is, quote unquote, an expert. And hopefully they get good guidance. Yeah. Okay. And then last, can you just share a little bit about your experience with the First Lady? Um, yeah, sure. I, um, so I had a loft space in, um, Elst on Elston, and I was selling to stores. And um, at that point, you know, I was, st clients were calling me because I had st started my second company and saying, you know, I'd love to come and see your collection. Uh, the stores only have a few pieces that we notice, and I'm, I, I think you have a broader range. Great. So people started shopping with me directly. And then um, a, a really good friend, uh, a good client said, there's a woman that you should meet. Her husband's really like kind of, she's in the spotlight more and she really needs some, you know, I think she would love your clothes. So my first uh, experience with Michelle, with the first lady, whoops. <laughs> I keep wanting to say Michelle, my best friend. Um, with the first lady. Oprah, Oprah too, or is it Ms. Winfrey? Oprah, yeah, yeah. Oprah is okay, I think, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so um, I addressed Michelle for the swearing in when he won the Senate. And, um, and then we continued to address her through, um, for a long time, through the whole campaign. And she's wonderful, super cool woman. So you never did custom for her? I did for her. Um, a few pieces that were really important because she was going to, um, the one actually was Oprah's house. She was doing a, uh, there was this weekend in women in uh, Legends, Legends mm -hmm. Ball. Yeah. And she came to me, and she, what was cool about Michelle is she just so trusted, you know, because we had a, a nice track record. She said, whatever you want us to wear, whatever you want me to wear, it was black and white. I'm like, you have to wear white. And we did this killer dress, and it was featured, ended up being featured in Vogue. So a few pieces here and there, but, you know, I don't do it a lot because I, unless it's someone who's going to let me have carte blanche. Like I have a good friend in the front row here who I'm doing something for special right now. But they kind of have to trust me because I can't like, you know, you can't come to me with seven pictures and say, I want the bodice here and I want the skirt here. I can't uh, think that way, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. is that good? You answer you? So. Hi. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering, going back to Kickstart, how it sounds, so I'm not very familiar with that process either. And it sounds like you had a marketing campaign where you kind of drew people's attention to the fact that you were on Kickstart trying to um, raise that money. Can you talk us more through that marketing plan? And who did, how did you choose targets for that marketing plan? It was, it was I, wish could, I wish I could say that it was so, so much more a plan than it was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone in this room that knows me knows how not planned how big part of it was. <laughs> we didn't really know what we were getting into. Um, we went into it saying, okay, let's get the press. So, you know, Sunday we launched, New York Times covered it. Um, on Monday, the Associated Press covered it. So we had the press piece covered, but it was n not getting the numbers going. And what we recognize is people still want to touch and feel. So our strategy a week into it was events. Then you pick up the phone and you call everybody you know. And when one person was at an event, she'd say, this is really cool. I want my friends to see it. Let me host an event for you. So we did something with Splash at Sunda. And then someone else, you know, and it became this thing like, that's what crowdfunding is. It's you're building a community. And that's part of the reason I did it. I didn't know how much of the community I'd be like knocking on doors. But, you know, people want to support people. I mean, and that's the great thing about, I think, I don't know other cities, but I think Chicago is amazing in that way, is that when people see a good idea, they want to support it. Why not? I've backed about eight projects on Kickstarter. I think it's really cool. I'd highly recommend doing it, but know that when you post it on Kickstarter, nothing's going to happen. You need to go out and market it yourself. Right. You know, you need to have your database ready. I can tell you, like, the event piece, you can t you'd be ahead of me. You should have events scheduled with your friends and make it something really desirable that people can't walk away from. But it's... And was that, was that like, a national... Um, focus, or were you just focused on the Chicago area? How did well, it was happening so quickly that it was primarily in Chicago, but I did an event in, in New York as well. Okay. And if I were doing an event, if I were doing Kickstarter again, part of my strategy would be events, and I would have had them scheduled all over the country. I would have been on a junket, like, get me on a plane, do it tonight, get on mm -hmm. another plane, because that's how Kickstarter works. It is not going to come to you. You have to go get it. 
I mean, maybe in years to come, I think Kickstarter is going to be around. I think there's going to be other crowdfunding resources like uh, Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were deliberate. We chose Kickstarter because it's more branded and already people kind of knew it. I think Indiegogo is really less known. But I think as years to come, it'll get easier. People will get to know it more, especially this like fe you know female market. It's not there. They're not going to it. Actually, I did an Indiegogo campaign, oh, you did? and I was advised that it was a, a better platform for designers. That it was more, it was more artsy in that way, and more garment directed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than uh, than Kickstarter. Right. I had a far more modest but successful campaign. I'm happy to say. <laughs> um, so we're about at the end of our time. Um, if there aren't any other questions, just one last announcement. It's again a reiteration of, uh, it's an invitation for all of you here. Please join us this evening for a networking reception with your peers in Sydney R. Yates Hall on the fourth floor from 4.30 to 7 p.m. Complimentary beverages and hors d'oeuvres will be provided and the event will be served by students from Washburn Culinary Institute. So again, we wanna thank Maria Pinto for her time this afternoon. Amazing, thank you very much for being here. Thank you.